Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining today to, for the Monks podcast. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you. Thank you for sparing your time. Yes, I've been looking forward to it. Thank you, Maharaj. If Maharaj, I had read about you and read your books for many years, but my first interaction was with you when you were write, writing this book, Many, Many Moons. And then I got the opportunity to, Gaurang Prabhu forwarded that book to me and then we interacted at that time. Since then, yes. I have been very deeply inspired by your deep uh, an extraordinary uh, absorption in the small, small details of bhakti and especially often the details that are overlooked, that uh, often they don't get the due attention. And one such thing is the end of life care. You, you wrote that book. That book was talking about the departed Vaishnavas. And then after that, you had another book about life's final exam. So this yes. is, in one sense, a central aspect of our philosophy. Life is for preparing for death. But how did you choose to focus on this subject in your writing? Yes, uh, I would say that the um, that the main I I inspiration to focus on it in my writing and even in my service was a disciple of mine from South Africa named Archavigraha Devi Dasi. In fact. I have her photo here. Oh. Yeah. She was a, 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 a well-known artist in South Africa. And at a certain point, she was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And I suggested that she... Uh, I mean, she had a beautiful home in Yeovil in Johannesburg. I suggested that she wind up her activities there and uh, come to Vrindavan. Even before then, she had built a house in Vrindavan. Uh, she was one of the first and she kept the ground floor for herself and the upstairs floor for me when I came to Vrindavan. And uh, it, she loved Vrindavan. And, you know, eventually, as was inevitable, uh, she left her body. But one of her final wishes, which she expressed to me, was that she wanted other devotees to have the opportunity to leave their bodies in Vrindavan. And at the time, the medical care available in Vrindavan was not very good. So she added that she would like those devotees for whom we create a facility to have a, you know, better access to good medical care. And that was the beginning of the idea of the Bhaktivedanta Hospice in Vrindavan. And uh, you know, the hospice has uh, served many, uh, many devotees. Uh, and a lot of hospice care is done to people in their homes. And so we, we did a lot of that, but we also had a, a, a substantial facility uh, in Ramanreti in Vrindavan where uh, devotees could come and spend their last days. 
And with hospice care, the emphasis is, is on what they call palliative care, making the patient comfortable. By definition, one cannot enter into hospice as long as one is trying to cure the uh, disease which is expected to be terminal. Hospice is for patients who have given up the attempt to cure themselves from their life-threatening illness. Mm. And, you know, that was the case with Mother Archavigraha. Naturally, everyone tries uh, every possible cure, but with Mother Archavigraha and pretty much everyone who comes in hospice, she came to the conclusion that she was not going to recuperate. And so she, she spent her last days in, um, well, her last days and really months and actually years in Vrindavan in, in the home that she built. And um, she was very fortunate, we, we all were very fortunate that her next door neighbor was His Holiness Bhakti Bringa Govinda Swami. Oh. And he would come every day, he would bring his deities, he would uh, bring prasad for her, and he was a real friend to her and Shiksha Guru. Because we, we know from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, we know from the Bhagavatam, Ante Narayana Smriti, that the goal of life is to remember Krishna at the time of death. But how do we remember Krishna at the time of death? So Bhakti Bringa Govinda Swami encouraged Mother Archavigraha to um, absorb herself in, in, in Krishna's pastimes and even to uh, visualize herself in them. I mean, that's a, it's a little a complicated subject. But um, Krishna means Krishna, his name, his, his forms, his qualities, his pastimes, his entourage, his paraphernalia. And so she was learning how to do that fix her mind on Krishna. And at that time, many senior devotees were um, spending a lot of time in Vrindavan and uh, trying to go deep in um, Bhakti Shastras. And uh, Almost every afternoon, a group of these devotees, which included His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami, His Holiness Shivaram Swami, His Holiness Bhakti Govinda Swami, uh, myself, I think His Holiness Keshav Bharati Das Goswami, they would come and read a, a, a drama written by Srila Rupa Goswami called Vidagda Madhava. And different of the devotees would take the parts of different of the characters in the drama. And it was a way of 
well, it was enlivening for all of us, but specifically it was a way of helping her to become absorbed in uh, Krishna's pastimes. And as I mentioned, she had the, the desire that others could also come and leave their bodies in Vrindavan, and that was really the seed mm -hmm. of, of, of the Bhaktivedanta hospice. And at the hospice, they have a nice picture of her at the um, entrance, mm -hmm. because she was really the inspiration uh, that, behind it. Yes, Maharaj. That's, that's, I've heard this story before, but the details which you told, I don't, didn't register me now when we're focusing on this topic. So basically it is not just medical care, but also because of the devotee association, there's a lot of facility for remembering Krishna also. And in some ways I have been to the hospice and you know, there is a lot of, uh, I would say from the Indian perspective, it's a very generous facility. In India, it's like a five-star hospital. And it's very suited for uh, devotees who actually may not be from India and they will find it reasonably comfortable there. And because it is not very far from the various sacred places, there's a lot of access to the, the, devotion, the devotional rich resources with which Vrindavan is rich. So, hmm. Maharaj, which year was all this a rough timeline? Oh, um... Well, she left in, in um, 1994, and she was in Vrindavan maybe for three years before then. Yes, Maharaj. And the hospice started roughly when? Oh, that would have been... Um, I could check, but maybe okay. 2001 or something. Okay. So, in India, even now, hospices are not that common. So, I presume this must have yeah. been one of the first hospices there. Yes, even the Vrindavan or any other sacred places yeah. like that? Yes. It's true, because we wanted some of the devotees to be trained in hospice work mm. and we were surprised to find that there was really only one hospice in all of India, oh. uh, in South India. And so one of the leading hospices in the world and the leading hospice in education is in San Diego. In, uh, in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And so some, mm -hmm. some of the devotees who were going to be involved in our hospice in Vrindavan, they were medical doctors, uh, they came to San Diego and they were trained in um, end of life care there. Okay. And then after that, they came to uh, my ashram in Carpinteria, and together we visited uh, one or two hospices in Santa Barbara. Even a small place like Santa Barbara has, has two hospices. And, um, you know, they learned a lot. You know, the, 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 the field of hospice care, although it's it involves doctors and nurses, but the goal is a little different because for some people it's a calling, mm. but some people, they, they don't like it. They want the patient to get cured and go home healthy. So yeah, we had one, <laughs> one lady from Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Mumbai who came but she was like that. She, she didn't. She did, she wanted the patients to get cured and go home. She didn't want to just be there with them for their departure. But for many devotees, it's a calling. And um, 
as you rightly said, the whole goal is to help the devotee think of Krishna at the time of death, you know, mm-hmm. Antenarayan Smriti. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, whatever state you leave your body, in whatever state you leave your body, to that you attain. Mm-hmm. That you attain. So, um, so that's the that's the ultimate goal of the end of life care is to help the devotee, help the patient, help the devotee think of Krishna at the time of death and go to Krishna. Go back home, back to Godhead. Yes, Maharaj. So actually, uh, before our meeting, I was just reading a little bit about hospice. It is both uh, very sobering at the same time, quite spiritualizing. And I read one of the, uh, I think the reviews or endorsements of your book. So there, one of the reviewers says that this is a this is an area where sp- a spiritual wisdom and human need meets each other. So yes, it's a, I've thought it was very well articulated, and uh, so now, I, so I was looking at why hospices are not so common in India. So it, I found two three reasons, but I may I thought you'll ask you and then one is that India still has the culture of family members taking care of their elders. Second is that uh, also, in general, healthcare is not that developed. So hospice is much more like a specialized healthcare. And third also is that it seems, at least in some parts of the Western world, uh, the lifespan, the longevity has increased substantially. And that's why, in general, for people who are older, the health care facilities are more. So there are just like there are, there are homes for elderly people. Similarly, there are hospices also. So it seems slowly the last five, 10 years, India has also started developing because in this direction, because India also is becoming more uh, urbanized and traditional family structure is not there so much. And also people need this kind of care. But uh, for you, what, what were your observations when you had to pioneer this in India? Was there receptivity or was there seen like a unusual idea and both in Vrindavan locally as well as in the devotee community there? Well, devotees are a good field because they know they're not the body. Mm. They know that death means that their real self, which is the soul, the atma or jivatma, that death means that the jivatma is leaving the body Mm. and that they will continue to exist. So then the question is, after leaving the body, where will you go? Mm. And again, based on the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the goal is Krishna, to go back home, back to Godhead. And that goal can be reached by thinking of Krishna at the time of death. And so it's a great advantage to be surrounded by devotees at the time of death, um, helping one remember Krishna. And this idea is common to other traditions as well. I used to preach in Pakistan and there I came across a book called The 99 Names of Allah. Like we have the thousand names of Vishnu. Mm. Vishnu saw Surinam, so they're the 99 names of Allah. And in that book, it said that the best thing that uh, the loved ones and family members of someone who's dying can do is help the person uh, remember the name of Allah at the time of death. So um, it it is a universal principle, but it, it it the art or the science is certainly uh, most developed in uh, Vaishnav tradition, 
And um, can you elaborate this? Uh, so when you say it's most developed, in what sense is it? Uh, yeah. Well, they have the most clear understanding of where the soul can go after leaving the body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other traditions, it's sort of vague, like they want to go to heaven. Of course, we know that there's, there's like a material heaven in the material universe, Swargaloka. But beyond the material universe, there's a spiritual sky, which has spiritual planets presided over by Vishnu Murtis. And then there's the supreme spiritual planet, um, Goloka Vrindavan, the planet of Krishna. And we have such a rich tradition for remembering Krishna. We have, you know, the holy name, so many songs, of course, mainly the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, many songs, bhajans, and uh, literature, immense literature. I mean, if you take the <clears throat> Quran or the Holy Bible, and compare them just in terms of volume, they're small when compared with Srimad Bhagavatam. And then we also have Chaitanya Tamrita. So there's a vast literature to occupy the mind of, of, of the devotee who is preparing for death. Yes, Maharaj. And also, I don't think there's that much disc positive description of God. Even if the Bible has a lot of stories, you know, it's, it's one thing to directly remember the Lord and another thing to remember the people in whose life God intervened. That's also uplifting. But especially in the final days, I think remembering the Lord directly is, is quite enriching in its own way. Yes. Yes, like what? His Holiness Bhakti Bringa Govinda Swami Maharaj told Mother Archivigra you know, detailed information of the spiritual world and God and his devotees and their activities. You don't find that anywhere else. Yeah. So Maharaj, since you started this, uh, so overall, how has been the uh, experience with the uh, having the hospice and devotees taking care, devotees being taken care of. How has been the response? I read the books that not only devotees have been served over there, but also local Rajwasis have been served and sometimes devotees, parents and relatives have also been served. So that book was, I think, almost uh, five, six years ago. That time itself, it seemed that it was uh, already a, a very uh, inspiring stories of people being spiritualized in yes. their life days. So overall, how has been that experience? Yeah, I mean, people have appreciated the hospice so much. We had different types of rooms. Uh, our, our first priority was for the pioneers in ISKCON. And so there are some uh, private rooms for them, but we also wanted to serve the uh, local people, the Rajavasis. And for them, we had common rooms, not very big, but three beds per room. Okay. And, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of hospice care is covered at people's homes. And so our, our main hospice doctor, um, Ananta Singha Prabhu, a disciple of His Holiness Radhanath Swami, and uh, 
uh, you know, you could say treat them. And then there's another di division, which is caregivers of the patient at home, a break, hmm. a respite. And so respite care means that for a period of whatever, a week or two, we bring the patient from home into the hospice to give the caregivers at home a break. Because, you know, it's also taxing. It's also taxing on them. So it's good for them to get a, a break or a rest, but, um, and then they can come back to their service at home, you know, with more enthusiasm and, mm. and strength. So Maharaj, when you were also there with Srila Prabhupada in 1977, during his uh, yeah. final pastimes. So at that yeah. time, of course, you know, being with Prabhupada must have been very intense. But did you have any idea that in future something, that, that for other devotees, something like this should happen or may happen, or you might play a role in that? No, uh, I didn't. At the time, uh, the opening of the Juhu Temple was a, a very big issue. And um, as it is, the temple opened exactly two months after Srila Prabhupada left. Mm -hmm. But he was very concerned that the temple should open. And he, um, you know, he made me the temple president in Juhu. And uh, he, he expected that I would uh, be focused in Juhu. So these developments came later, you know, Vrindavan, end of life care, and the hospice. And, yeah. Whenever I talk about Krishna consciousness, and uh, in one of the things which we can talk about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, we can talk about the global spread. But for those who are a little bit more serious, spiritually interested, the stories of how devotees have departed in graceful consciousness surrounded by devotees around them that is that is among the most uh, not only inspiring but also convincing so it actually mm. goes beyond the head to the heart and although people don't think about death much but still everybody at the back of mind knows that that's going to happen to me and if that is the time when Krishna consciousness can actually help. And that, that actually is very faith boosting. Mm. So when I travel across the world, I, I somehow find that many devotees don't even know much about the hospice, or don't know much about the idea of end of life care. Of course, we hear stories about how devotees always want to leave their body in Krishna consciousness and they should remember Krishna but like a specialized effort for uh, providing that kind of facilities. So that across the world, at least whatever little I have traveled for the last five, six years, I haven't noticed that much. So is it because we are still a young movement and we are more in a phase of expansion? It's, it's such a wonderful facility. And uh, it's something which, which I would say every devotee will need in the long run. So, have you seen the, uh, say, the awareness about end-of-life care and the importance of facility like this spreading across our movement over the years? I would say that as uh, Srila Prabhupada's disciples are growing older, they are more aware of it. Yes, they're more aware of their impending deaths and they're more aware of the need for to leave their bodies in congenial atmosphere. Yeah. And of course, Vrindavan is uh, the ideal place to leave your body. Srila Prabhupada himself set the example mm. and uh, departed there. But not everyone can go there. And one 
devotee with whom I've been working very closely is uh, Sangeeta Devi Dasi, also Srila yes, yes. Prabhupada's disciple. I have and read her on Hospice Care, I think. It's a very, yeah. again, a very sobering book, but very, very equipping for somebody who has to uh, offer care at that time. Yeah. Yeah, called The Final Journey. Yes. And uh, so she formed an organization called Vaishnava's Care uh, to, to give support to the, the dying and their loved ones. Because the loved ones also are challenged at, at mm. that time. First of all, they want to help care for their loved one and they may not know how. Mm. And then they, they also have their own grief. Yeah. And so, so part of, in a way, you know, part of our hospice care is to cater um, not only to the patient, but to, to their loved ones. Hmm. and help them through that uh, grieving process. And she means uh, Mother Sangeeta has established Vaishnav care teams in various places. Uh, and those teams help people at the end of life. And she wanted, but I don't know it, how successful it was because it wasn't within her power per se, but she wanted every temple to have a room that could be available for devotees leaving their bodies. I mean, it doesn't have to lie vacant, but when the time comes that a devotee does need a room in the temple community uh, to leave to leave their bodies, that the room should be available. Yes, ma'am. And yes. yeah. I think you now when I was in Pune and then I have been in Chopati, when some devotees are needed like that, there have been there was one Brahma, the two Brahmachari brothers whose mother had passed away or she was in the last stages. And then they got her to a temple and uh, she was she also stayed in the temple and her sons took care of her. And it was a very moving story. She she became completely transformed. She had been quite heartbroken when her sons had joined. But I think I shared that story with you. It was published in Back to God also. And in Radha Gopinath Temple, of course, Toka Krishna Prabhu's story is there. He he left in the temple itself. Radha Maharaj is also there with him. So, yes. So, two questions, Maharaj, about this. First is that you know, there is our movement or we could say there is our institution and there is the broader movement. So institution is basically the ISKCON's uh, official structures. And then the movement is broadly the devotees who are inspired and devotees work and do many things. So what I've seen is quite a, in a, quite a few areas where in something which has not been normally done in the history of our movement, in the recent history, that usually starts with individual devotees taking up some initiative. So generally, you could say things start in the movement and then gradually something starts happening within the institution. So in one sense, what you started also was with the initiative of you and Archivigra Mataji, and now it expanded. So uh, now Prabhupada did talk about, uh, uh, about this in, the, in many of his books that you know, we all have to remember Krishna at the time of that. As you said, it's an important part of our tradition. Uh, but at that time, probably for him to, he didn't give any institutional directive to prepare any resources like that. At that time, our focus was more on building temples and uh, maybe distributing books, making devotees. So, so as our movement expands, then we will also have to, uh, we'll also have to recognize various, you could say not exactly newer, but newer for our move, for our movement, newer ways of providing Krishna consciousness for 
our mem our devotees as well as for those connected with devotees and this was yes ma'am and hospice is probably one of the most important ones what do you think about this in this framework yes uh yeah hospice is very important mm. um but again one is hospice care and the other is the hospice physical facility mm and uh, again you know hospice care is done in people's homes a lot although the physical facility also has its part to play but i found that often devotees who have got the benefit of hospice care mm look to do some sort of volunteer service in the field of hospice because they have so much realized the benefit of it. Mm. Yeah, there was one couple in Dallas. Uh, the, the husband was uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada's disciple and the wife was uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami's disciple. And the girl's mother was you know terminal and she was staying at home with them and um you know initially there wasn't very much interest in the temple of devotees visiting them which in a way sort of hurt them or disappointed them but i found out and i started to visit and then when i visited others would come with me and uh because of my experience with hospice you know i knew quite a bit about what to do mm -hmm. and so they were you know very very appreciative and then afterwards after her mother left the daughter she she wanted to do volunteer work in hospice to to pay back or pay forward the benefit that she had gotten from hospice and also um often people who go into hospice are quite spiritual um when my father was terminal at home in Glencoe, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. We had some uh nurses visiting and they were quite spiritual. And I would say that to go into hospice you have to have a spiritual orientation otherwise it's just it's too depressing, it's too morbid, it's too <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just disappointing so i've i've seen that with hospice people they're they're usually quite uh, spiritual yes, not devotees as such but spiritual yes my this also i uh, this also i noticed that as you know our movement has gone beyond the institution most of our devotees don't live inside the temples now so more and more devotees are looking for say professions that are broadly at least compatible with devotion spiritual principles mm -hmm. if not directly spiritual so mm -hmm. there are not many professions like that in today's world i think hospice is one of the few ones and of course as you said i have said some talk with some devotees about it and one needs a particular it's not just being spiritual even while being spiritual also not everybody who is spiritually serious also can actually take the atmosphere of the uh, of the hospice as you said it yeah. can become quite morbid so but it is a quite a important it is quite a uh, it is very good avenue for devotees also to actually be a professional at the same time be spiritual and share something spiritual with others have you seen yeah. any movement in, for devotees in this direction in the devotee community oh well 
Well, as you were speaking, I thought of uh, Mother Sangeeta, yes. because she was a hospice nurse uh, for 10 years. And out of what she learned as a hospice nurse, she was able to create Vaishnava's care and um, personally help people with end of life care and train people. She gives courses in person and online. And she's, she's trained quite a few devotees in um, end of life care, but not as a profession for the devotees, but just as, okay. as a skill uh, that they can use in service to other devotees. But I, I agree with you, it is, it is, it's a very congenial field in which a devotee can, can enter, you know, and be trained professionally, earn a livelihood, and at the same time, be a good spiritual influence at people. And of course, when people are coming to the end of their lives, if they're pious, at least, um, they'll want to have some spiritual orientation. They probably have many questions that a devotee could answer. So I, I would encourage any devotee who has that inclination to go into that field. Very, uh, very rewarding. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, when I think this whole field, uh, currently many of these uh, fields where it's almost on the verge of life and death, it is, in, has it been pioneered by the Christian community to some extent? Or is it, is it I know it is overall you had to expect it to be secular, but uh, are there a lot of Christians also working in these fields? Means is there a com why I'm asking this? Is there like a do devotee in really normal professions, devotees cannot really share their faith or share their spirituality? And here also, I think people people not be expecting like a deathbed. Uh, you cannot force your ideology onto people on their deathbed. But uh, so, how does it work in these settings? Are they secular or are they? It's up to the individual what they want entirely, or how does it work? You mean up to the patient? Up to the patient. When they say the... Yeah. I mean the, yeah. Uh, yes, it is up to the patient, but there are universal principles. For example, we're not the body, we're the soul. And death means that the soul leaves the body. And then where does the soul go? And every religious tradition will have the idea that if you do good deeds, you'll go to a good destination. If you do bad deeds, you'll go to a bad destination. And so there is scope. And again, people at that time could be uh, very interested in questions about the body and the soul and the destination of the soul after leaving the body. So there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the principles of the Bhagavad Gita are quite universal. As Srila Prabhupada always says, it's not a Hindu scripture. You never find the word Hindu in the Bhagavad mm. Gita. But it's a science, spiritual science. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful field for devotees. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's a growing awareness in hospice that the, um, that the doctors and nurses have to be aware of different spiritual traditions or religious traditions, because they can get patients from any tradition. And they, sh they should be 
knowledgeable about the different traditions so they know how to deal with the patients properly. Mm. Commit any blunders. Yes, Manaj. I, uh, I have read some literature on hospice care and some like some stories of people who were in hospice, some biographies or something. So it seems that what you said, they're very, very thoughtful, very spiritual, very deeply compassionate also within their mm. understanding of things. So sometimes we say that the world is becoming more and more materialistic, which is of course true. But within that also, there seem to be some areas where uh, consciousness is rising. So yeah. I, you, I, for some of those, which I normally thought of before I read this book, I thought of yoga coming in the West is quite a bit, big thing. Mindfulness is where people are also becoming more, recognizing something more than the body. Then there is, of course, vegetarianism or veganism. And there's environmental consciousness. And these are quite big. Hospice is not that big, but hospice is also an area which does, to some extent, indicate at least some rising to the mode of goodness, if not spirituality. Yeah. So do you see any reasons why this has happened? Like there are, with respect to mindfulness, people had a lot of mental health problems. With respect to environmental consciousness, there is a crisis which is there actually. So how do you see the hospice uh, whole uh, area developing and it becoming so spiritually receptive? Uh, any reasons you see for this happening? And any ways we can, apart from individual devotees going into that area, any ways in which this can become an area where Krishna consciousness can contribute? Oh, well, uh, yeah, literature is always um, good. I mean, our tradition is really about death to a large extent. I mean, the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit was waiting for the time of death. And his question, you know, what, what is the duty of a man who is about to leave his body? And then the answer, you know, one should hear, chant, and remember the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's like the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, yeah, I was invited to, uh, to give a program at a hospital in Houston. And the, the topic was end of life care. And uh, there were people from all different religious traditions, but they were fascinated. And yeah, I brought my book, <laughs> Life's Final Exam. And uh, I, I think probably 80% of the participants uh, bought a copy. And they were, uh, they were impressed that this is a science. It's not just some religious sentiment, but it's, it's, it's a science that can benefit anyone and everyone. And none of, they didn't feel threatened that like that their that their faith was being challenged, but they saw this as something like Prabhupada always said, you know, you can add this yeah. to what you already are and become a better Hindu or Christian or Muslim. So, uh, yeah, it was I found that to be a very rewarding um, program. Yes, Maharaj. It's interesting you're mentioning this as a science. When I was, when I was visiting uh, America, I was in New Jersey, and there one devotee had asked me to speak and about the, to come in the, it was a hospice, and they had asked me to come um, to their medical caregivers about what is the Hindu perspective of end of life care. So, hmm. what is the vision? And I had taken your book also at that time, and they took, they took a book for their library. So, now there, because they are specifically, they had asked us to present from Hindu perspective. So I mm. did present and 
I was a little hesitant to use the word science, but when I spoke the principles, of course, I presented it in a universal way. So there are two aspects to it. One is that we say that this is our faith and this is our uh, this is this is what our tradition teaches us. And another thing is that we actually present the contents of what we have. So there are there is there is the philosophical aspect which is quite universal. Like you talk about the soul and the journey of the soul and the idea of our action, we being accountable for our actions and our consciousness at time of death determining things. So that is quite universal. The specifics of what we do at the time of death, say the Krishna conception of God, the specific mantras we chant, the images that we keep next to us, and some of the rituals that we practice, say they can seem a little uh, specific to a particular tradition. and in those circles they may not call it sectarian but they won't see that as universal so when you say it's a, it's universal or it's a science can you elaborate on that a little bit uh yeah it, it's a science in that it it teaches universal principles and it has nothing to do with whether one is a hindu christian muslim or whatever and although people may associate some elements of uh, vaishnavism with a particular religious tradition um those elements are not required in uh of the patient who's who's reaching the end of life um i mean for me wearing a dhoti and kurta is favorable because it reminds me of shila prabhupad and of chaitanya mahaprabhu also so it has some value in terms of smaranam remembering um but that would be uh, somewhat esoteric as far as people in general um but yeah it's uh it's really a great blessing to help someone on their final journey so to speak it's a great blessing to be able to serve them in in that way yes manaj so when you say that the principles are universal so this is and then there are specifics which are not essential this itself also is a very you could say very inclusive uh, understanding of bhakti rather than more like a exclusive understanding so so in a sense if we are practicing like you you know when you said that when you wear dhoti kurta i thought you will say it will help you remember krishna and of course what you said to remember prabhupad because of course prabhupad was those that was a very in a surprising but uh, illuminating explanation that you gave so in one sense for these specific cultural practices could we apply that principle of say anukulya se sankalpa pratikulya se varjanam and accept what is favorable and then we give the principles to people and then whichever of the specifics they they feel favorable for them they will take it up yeah yeah yes maharaj and uh, so when you said that you had gone to that houston hospital uh, and you gave a talk over there so overall how much is the awareness of the say of the vaishnav traditions insights that can be provided you said people were very open to it that means they didn't know much about it beforehand so is it that mostly there's not much awareness of all this 
even in the hospice yeah. field about the partic- about our traditions uh, say rich contribution that are available they they didn't know much okay they didn't know much uh, they were pretty much christians although there is one man who looked uh, oriental i think he i think he was buddhist um but yeah they they're very open very interested very appreciative and um they could see the universality of it okay and when uh, have you had any experiences that you would like to share of say people who were new and their exp- their exposure to vaishnavism or that first or major exposure to vaishnavism was during the stage of hospice and then that helped them are there any experiences like that maharaj that you would like to share um i can't say about patients but i can say about staff oh that's him for me yes please when i was um like one of the uh major stepping stones on this path for me was my visit to uh San Diego Hospice and Palliative Care and uh so they asked me to speak about you could say you know death and dying from the vedic perspective mm and uh, they were very uh impressed by our uh, philosophy and practices and in fact after my presentation at the hospice some of the staff wanted to come to our temple in San Diego oh, and join the kirtan and hear the discourse <laughs> so yeah it definitely has the power to influence people but my experience at the hospice was really with the staff i wasn't dealing with the patients there yeah and the patients at our hospice in brindavan they all know about krishna consciousness yes maharaj So as of now the hospice in rindavan is that the only hospice in our moment maharaj i think it's the only you could say free standing facility um as i mentioned mother sangeeta's been training devotees to give end of life care and in um and she has what she calls vaishnava's care teams who can be summoned at when needed and i know that that um there's you know awareness of it in alachua which is such a big devotee community in america and uh there was talk about having a hospice in alachua um but i don't know if they actually have a hospice facility but they're aware of the principle of end of life care and their devotees who've been uh taught by mother sangeeta to to give end of life care yes ma'am and i heard and i heard there was some interest to do some do like something like a hospice in mayapur and some devotee or devotees in mayapur wrote me to get information which i supplied but um i don't know to what extent they've moved forward but they were definitely thinking to have a hospice in mayapur and it would be it would be wonderful to have a hospice in mayapur uh, you already have a whole city there almost like a town which is quite big Yeah. yeah. So Maharaj you chose Rindavan for the hospice was that circumstantial because Archivir Mataji departed there and Prabhupada also departed there or was it a conscious choice 
at Rindavan, not Mayapur? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I had a base in Vrindavan. I mean, mm. Mother Artavira's house. I would visit Mayapur, you know, for Gaur Purnima, but mostly I would spend my time in Vrindavan. Mm. Mother Artavira was there. And there was land available. At one stage, the devotees wanted to make a Prabhupada park in Vrindavan. Oh, and somehow that project never really developed, but they had that land for the Prabhupada park. Okay. And uh, so I found out who, I guess you could say the trustees were for the land or, you know, the promoters were for the park. And I explained the hospice project, and they were very happy to, to hand over that land to us uh, to use for the hospice. So it seemed like it was meant to be in Vrindavan. Oh. And Mother Archavidraha left there, Srila Prabhupada left there, and I was spending more time there, much more time there than in Mayapur. Yes. Earlier you mentioned one thing about literature, that literature is also one way you can contribute. So as of now, is your book the major, only literature that we have? Satyaraj Prabhu has written a book on death and dying in, it's more like a compi compi comparison or compilation of various traditions, including our tradition. But from our tradition's perspective, as of now, is your book the only one that is there? Yeah, and Mother Sangeeta's The of Final course, yeah. Journey. Yeah, yeah, that's more of a hands-on care. But it's not, I mean, there's not so much of the theology or philosophy. It is there, but it's not, not so much of an exposition. It's more of a hands-on care book. There might be, let, 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 let me just see. I have, a, I have a death and dying section in my book, my library. Yes, Manaj. I knew there was one more. Oh. <laughs> I have my little section on death and dying. Although I can't, th this is by Bhakti Purushottam Swami. Oh, okay. It's called The Final Call, Death. Oh, okay. Um, it has it it has some good uh, i'll just read the different sections section 1 understanding death section 2 overcoming death section 3 hell after death okay section 4 death and, death and the lord section 5 glorious departures this is an interesting section because most of my, I mean, my books tell about the departures of our contemporaries, but his section, Five Glorious Departures, The Death of King Chitraketu's Son. Oh, okay. The Death of Srivas Pandit's Son. The Death of Richasura. Okay. The Death of Bharat Maharaj. And then... The Glorious Departure of Srila Prabhupada, The Disappearance of Srila Gorgovinda Swami, and Reflections on the Departure of His Holiness Bhaktivedanta Swami. And then Section 6, Appendixes, Srila Prabhupada on Death, Near-Death Experiences, What the Mahabharata Says About Death. So there is, there is, there is one more book. Oh, yes, Maharaj. So this seems to be more in the genre of like many, many moons than your death and dying. Because at least the examples are very directly devotional. And yeah. in one sense, that would be the, it would be more suited for a devotee audience or an Indian audience who is familiar with the stories. I don't think people can relate with the demons dying as a story of, 
of a or of suppose rutrasur dying it will be a little too far out yes, for yes. new people so that's true yes maharaj so but your book when when we when we went through that book and uh, i noticed that you had kept it a very uh, very universal very accessible to everyone the the second was, book yes maharaj that was the intention that was the intention that's maharaj and in fact uh as usual with my first three books i printed in um america first and then i took the american edition to india and printed there and asked them to come up to the american standard hmm uh but in life's final exam i found that although it was really designed for a general audience i found that there were still things in the first printing in america that could be a little challenging for new people to uh understand and so in the second printing in india i I went through the whole text again and I removed uh the 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 passages you know the sentences or the passages that I thought would be difficult and I so I have the two editions I have copies of both editions with me and I'm very mindful with devotees it's fine they can they can have the original one Hmm. but with new people i'm very careful to give them the, the you could say second edition that i printed it in india that addressed a few areas that i perceived could be problematic for a new person to comprehend oh. yes maharaj so you mentioned that there's further literature if if somebody is to write something more because a literature contribution in one sense have you would you have some thoughts of what somebody could write because there are a lot of devotees who nowadays want to write of course writing a book is a big thing but uh, writing some articles or going in that genre so there are different ways in which we can present the introductory there are many different ways to introduce people to krishna consciousness through like yoga environmentalism self help but in the genre of uh, in this end of life your book is going to be the foundational in our movement mm. not just because you wrote it first but also because it is quite comprehensive mm. in terms of having first the philosophical section and then a gamut of experiences not just of say practitioners uh movements practitioners or cultural practitioners but even others so if somebody is to write in this genre what what kind of contribution do you think what would be the way to write in that well you know writing is a matter of uh, inspiration yes maharaj and i mean if someone is inspired to write about death and dying it i feel would be a very welcome contribution to the literature mm. but what approach they take would really be up to them you know what 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 uh what they want to communicate and as buri john prabhu sometimes said um you know you 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 learn what you had to say when you write oh sometimes we don't even know we 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 know we want to say something but we don't know exactly what we want to say but then when you start putting it down on paper you realize yes this is what i wanted to say yes man that's it this uh, i think this is almost every writer's experience i also realize you know we don't use words just to express thoughts we use them to discover thoughts also so mm. that's true nice mm, nice much so 
overall how has been the response to your book in the in the general community and have you used it for giving talks or to reach out to the hospice hospice world we could say yeah yeah um yeah yeah people appreciate what's in the book when they hear it from my mouth and then they appreciate what's in the book when they read the book um now with the lockdowns and everything you know not going out yes to talks but um yeah but i've i've heard from many non devotees or maybe i should say yeah i've heard from non devotees and i've heard from devotees who know non devotees who really appreciated the book like final exam and some of them said they wish they'd come across it earlier cuz it would have helped them deal with um some end of life situations but it's mm-hmm. it's it is very accessible to ordinary people so to speak yeah i've got very positive feedback yes ma'am my most of my uh, this podcast viewers are in india so if they want to get a copy of the book is it available on amazon or is there some place where they can contact for getting the books in case they oh, don't I have th- it already yeah i mean yes amazon i think most of the big temples have the books okay and definitely juhu has them vrindavan has them i think mayapur has them yes maharaj that's just, <laughs> that's nice if they get the books yes maharaj definitely thank you so maharaj you have also been writing a book on the juhu temple has that been i mean i'm moving from the hospice to subject to fine. some general That's questions fine. now would you like to add something about hospice further before we move on uh now we can move on yes maharaj so uh how is your book on the juhu temple coming now is it out or because of the lockdown it got delayed or how is it this is it Oh it's out. Yeah, I'll build you a temple. Beautiful. Jew story. Jew story, okay. Yeah. I think when we had discussed it you had said a promise fulfilled and a temp something like that was you changed the subtitle yeah. after that. Yes. The I, that was my original thought of the subtitle. Okay. A good one and a promise fulfilled. But uh I discussed with a few devotees and especially Indra Dumya Swami he thought it was too long. Okay. Just as some shorter options. And uh one of them was the Juhu story and we all sort of like that. I'll build you a temple the Juhu story. Oh, okay. Oh, so you get that is that is the website also by that name. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I, I, was this officially launched because I I had not seen yeah. this in India till now so much. Yes. So okay. the we launched it because the juhu temple opened on makara sankranti oh, january yes. 1978 exactly 2 months after she the prophet left and so we launched it on this makara sankranti which is always january 14th oh so it's just 5 days that's amazing yeah. oh <laughs> <laughs> yes it was it was a it was a glorious event it was a glorious event oh, okay yeah yes my so it's it's coincidental or krishna's arrangement that soon after the launch of this book we had this podcast i have, we had been planning to do it for almost 7 uh, 8 months now yeah so, mm. yeah it was good time it was good you asked about it yes my yeah would you like to share something about this book and how it originated and how it what it contains so that mm. yeah 
Well, um, I'll read uh, two quotations, or three, excuse me, three quotations from the back cover. Okay. Not by me, but they, so first is from Srila Prabhupada. It was a good fight. Someone should write a book about it. And then he said, it is worth writing history. Then from His Holiness Radhana Swami. I'll build you a temple transports us into one of the great events of our time. Giriraj Swami gives us personal witness into the life of Srila Prabhupada at a time when Prabhupada faced insurmountable odds at every step. The story reveals Prabhupada's unwavering faith, indomitable courage, and profound humility. I'll Build You a Temple is a contemporary narration that shares the emotions, excitement, and message of sacred texts such as the Ramayana, Mahabharata, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Bhagavad Gita, whose conclusive teachings are revealed through the lives of great souls, such as Srila Prabhupada, who battle and ultimately vanquish powerful enemies against seemingly insurmountable odds. Srila Prabhupada said that his project in Bombay was his heart. And then from His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami. Srila Prabhupada spent more time in Bombay, 554 days, than in any other city in the world. And that indicates the significance of the Druhu project and of this book. In I'll Build You a Temple, Giriraj Maharaj has translated his long years of commendable involvement in the leadership of Iskand Juhu, as well as his intense desire to serve Srila Prabhupada's instruction to him to write into a riveting, thoughtful, and inspiring book. I welcome you all to take a dip in the nectarian pastimes of Sri Sri Radha Rasa Bihari and Juhu, which glorify their pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada. That's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I was it's thinking, the, so this is among the few books that Prabhupada probably directly told someone to write. Yeah. Yes. That? Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's Things so yeah. he told Maharaj to write on that on Krishna conscious scientific basis. Yeah. But apart from that, I, I don't think that I meant, he told devotees to write in general, but not a yeah. specific book. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Srila Prabhupada's disciple Hari Sori, who is Prabhupada's uh, secretary for many years, he was also very excited that this is a book that Srila Prabhupada specifically asked to be written and now it's written <laughs> yes Maharaj, it's uh, i i haven't read the latest version but when i read the earlier version that you had shared with me it is uh, it is such a you could say focused and intimate uh, picture of prabhupad mm. you know, through lilamrut we get a we get a very broad overview of Prabhupada's life. That's also very sweet. And then through Harishauri Prabhu's book, we get a get. It's like a chronicle, but yes. because it's Prabhupada is going through various places and he's traveling. So how Prabhupada's vision manifests at a particular place, and how he works in a focused way, so that intimate your experience with Prabhupada and focused on a particular project. I don't think there's any book which is like that. We have had many books about Srila Prabhupada and they're all nectarian. But uh, that fo it's, uh, it's both uh, the life story of a project and the uh, life story of 
Shla Prabhupada as he we could say incubated and manifested the project. Yeah. Mm. So, so devotees, if they want this book, it's available. I, I, they will probably check the website and we can get it. This will be wonderful, Maharaj. And uh, yeah. so, are there any, maybe concluding one or two incidents you'd like to share from the book? Something which uh, is especially maybe inspiring or revealing about Shla Prabhupada's dedication or compassion? Oh, um, well, Back to Godhead magazine in America planned to uh, have a book excerpt. They regularly publish book excerpts. And then along with the book excerpt, have uh, have like a full page ad on the back page, on the back cover uh, for the book. Um, so I sent them a few, a few dramatic incidents and they chose the, the one about the demolition of the temple. Uh, although there was another really good one, but it was, yeah, I'm not sure exactly why they didn't take that one. But uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there's so much nectar in this. I'm not, let me see what might be good to read. Well, um, this, this thing that came to mind is not something I would have ever imagined would come into my mind, <laughs> oh. but it did. So it, it maybe, it maybe in a, in an, in an odd way, it's related to death and dying. Um, one Sunday, as I was walking through the streets of streets of Dobi Talao, that's uh, South Bombay, briefcase in hand, on my way to meet someone, I happened to stop for a moment by the Metro Cinema to look at the periodicals on sale along the sidewalk something I generally never did. Standing on the busy corner with traffic rushing from all directions, I glanced at the newspaper headlines, big, black, bold letters jumped out from one front page, quote, A.B. Nyer dead. And directly under the headline was a photos, photo of Mr. Nyer. I couldn't believe it. A.B. Nyer dead. How could it be? The paper was the Bharat Jyoti, the Sunday edition of the Free Press Journal, where Nyer had been editor. I was jubilant. I felt like dancing in ecstasy. But then I wondered if that was the proper way for a Vaishnav to respond. I'm supposed to be developing saintly qualities, I reflected. Maybe I should be feeling sorry. Still, I could not contain my exultation, and I rushed back to our flat in Kolaba to share the news. Bali Mardan, the most senior devotee there suggested we call Srila Prabhupada and went out to look for a phone. I decided I should go to Juhu. The devotees there had already heard the news and had been rejoicing and celebrating, chanting and distributing sweets. But I was still uncertain, was this the proper way for a Vaishnava to behave? 
when Bali Mardan phoned Auckland to inform Prabhupada of Nair's death, the phone call came during Prabhupada's morning massage just before lunchtime. Shruti Kirti was sitting on the floor behind him, massaging his back, with Tusta Krishna and Siddha Swarup nearby. Tusta Krishna took the call, and then Shruti Kirti came to the phone. After just a few minutes, Shruti Kirti ran back into the room. Srila Prabhupada, he said, that was Bali Mardan on the phone. He wanted to tell you that Mr. Nair is dead. Srila Prabhupada joined his hands together above his head as if in prayer. Oh, thank you, Krishna, he said. I prayed that Krishna would kill him. He caused us so much difficulty. He gave so much trouble to the devotees. I was praying that Krishna would do something to this demon. And he quoted a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam 7914. Yadyatsyam sarve. Prahlad Maharaj said, even a saintly person becomes placed when a, even a saintly person becomes pleased when a snake or a scorpion is killed. Mr. Nair was a big snake, so it is very good. Later that day, Prabhupada wrote to us in Bombay, quote, this morning, Shruti Kirti received telephonic message from Bali Mardan. It is understood that Mr. Nair is dead. So it is good news that Nishunga Dev has killed a demon like him. It is a matter of great pleasure for all devotees. So I was concerned whether it's proper to feel happy with the news that Nair had dead, had died. Um, but Srila Prabhupada, quoting this verse from Prahlad Maharaj, even, even a saintly person becomes pleased when a snake or scorpion is killed. So then I felt it was, it was justified. Yeah. It's amazing that at one level, and I was thinking from three, two, three different perspectives of the situation. If somebody who doesn't know anything about what all Mr. Nair had done, they would feel shocked that somebody is feeling happy and distributing sweets at, at the death of someone. Yeah. Uh, so it yeah. could be quite shocking. But you were hands on. So that is, you could say, one extreme reaction or one, 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 one typical reaction, we could say. The other is that those who knew, what uh, he had done, you know, he had actually tried to attack and uh, manhandle devotees, threaten devotees, try to destroy the temple and uh, done so many things. Uh, so the appellate demon is, uh, is actually not an exaggeration if you consider what he did. Yeah. Uh, if you consider demoniac to be a mentality, then definitely he had that. So, so and, and you bore the brunt of most of it because you were the leader over there. So in spite of that, you had that hesitation. So whereas other devotees, they were celebrating, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's revealing about how, I would say, how compassionate you are that even, so somebody who had, it was not just, he you were so kind in saying he troubled the devotees, but probably he troubled you also, in a sense, you were troubled hugely by him. Yeah. But still, you didn't... Uh, you still had that hesitation. So that is, uh, that is remarkable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so compassionate of you. So, but there's also the backstory, I think that Prabhupada, although Prabhupada was still compassionate to his wife and she eventually came and agreed. So there was yeah. no, in a sense, there was no animosity or hard feelings. 
So it is not. No, no, no. Yes, my. So, so we could say that this is almost the. Uh, this is almost the opposite of a way a devotee would ever want to die. The devotees want the blessings of. <laughs> we want the blessings that of devotees and uh, our spiritual guides when we are going to depart. Not that we want to have their. Uh, have them see us as a obstacle. So, yes, Maharaj. And uh, just one more thought I had when you were reading this that. the so prabhupad's response was actually and i was praying to krishna that that he be that something happen and uh, and when uh, you when you in, when you got that reply so did you feel sort of confirmed vindicated or how how would you Exp- explain that emotion to somebody who is say uh, who is new to bhakti. In that sense, uh, normally we would never want to harm anyone, but it is somebody who harms in such a severe way. How would you? Am I making myself clear? I mean, I just don't want somebody who has not read the book to or not read about the Jew Jew story so much. i don't think there will be many like that but it can be a little jarring so yeah. such an action how do we in such an incident how do we see a devotee's compassion so your hesitation itself is your compassion in one sense but in general when how, how do we understand that that principle of uh, even the saintly people being happy in, in such situations yeah well uh prolad statement was spoken to Nishinga Dev mm. after Nishinga Dev killed the demon Hiranyakashipu who was Prahlad's father mm. and after Nishinga Dev killed Hiranyakashipu he was still angry his anger did not subside immediately mm. and Prahlad apprehending that nishinga dev might have thought that prahlad might not be happy with him because he killed prahlad's father so prahlad uttered these words that <laughs> <laughs> that's an amazing realization mara yeah, <laughs> so yeah. he's reassuring the lord i am not unhappy with you <laughs> yeah yeah You even as saying that never thought a, of this prayer like that <laughs> yeah that's the context yeah so um yeah it's, it's such an amazing philosophy amazing culture that um yeah that you can take pleasure and shila prabhad also was sort of surprised Oh, uh, during his grihasta ashram, he visited um, his guru Maharaj in Mayapur, mm-hmm. and his guru Maharaj came out on the balcony, and he saw in the garden, in front of his house, a snake, and he ordered the disciples to kill it. and shila prabhupad describes that at the time he was very surprised that oh guru maharaj ordered the disciples to kill the snake because generally devotees are nonviolent but then shila prabhupad came across this verse mm. in shrimad bhagavatam mode uh, tasadar api vrikshika sarpahatya even a saintly person becomes pleased when a snake or a scorpion is killed then he realizes that yes guru maharaj did the right thing yes maharaj 
so this is a thank you for sharing this uh, extraordinary incident from the from your book maharaj and also for this explanation so uh, there is uh, there is so much nectar in that book and i hope that uh, the picture of shri prabhupa that you have gifted to the world more and more devotees as well as those who are coming to krishna they can relish that picture so yes. usually where are you right now okay i am in the govardhan eco village maharaj oh, okay yes thank you okay thank you so uh, usually toward the end of the podcast i try to summarize what we had discussed and then if you sure. like you can have some concluding words if you'd like to share so okay so today we discussed about this topic of end of life care and bhakti wisdom it was we went over a lot of territories so i'll try to broadly cover so you talked about how you became although it's our philosophy talks about it your specific journey began with um, archa vigraha mata ji's uh, diagnosis and then her departure and then that's how the hospice idea start started and then almost 7 8 years 5 6 years later it manifested and you were uh, you were among the first or second hospices in india the first in a holy place and i'm sure that must have required a lot of effort this thing that you had to get people from india to come from get people to come to san diego to get the training for that that itself indicates how much herculean efforts you put in to make that happen and then um, there it's is that the hospice is at one level providing care to people in the hospice as well as helping uh, family members take care of people at their homes and then we talked about how in the, those who come into hospice care they are naturally spiritually inclined otherwise it will become too morbid for them mm-hmm. and um, as devotees we our tradition it is it has a lot of it has all the all traditions talk about uh, having a having remembering the lord at the time of death but our tradition offers far more resources for remembering many pastimes of the lord and and many names of the lord and many different uh, devotional activities that we can do so in that sense uh, we have a rich resource and through your literature i uh, i think you have been the pioneer in making the wisdom of the bhakti tradition available for those who are in this field of hospice care so this is also one of the areas in which uh, people are becoming more elevated in their consciousness and being receptive to spirituality and uh, so in the way you you told me about i didn't know that in the second edition of your book you had carefully edited to make the book more accessible to new people so this is we also discussed how this is an area where devotees can actually enter into a profession also which is very congenial to spirituality because we can ourselves gain spiritual realizations and share spiritual wisdom so then you talked about how our our the principles of the bhagavad gita and the bhakti tradition are universal and there are certain specifics but like say you talked about you know wearing dhoti kurta which reminds you of shri prabhupad but that is something which is uh, that is not the central thing so if we present the principles then people can appreciate that not not only do we have a profound philosophy but it's it's like a science to help people aid them in their final stages of their life and you also shared your experiences of how people have been the, the caregiver the staff has been appreciative even came to the mm-hmm. temple that is uh, you know generally they try to stay a little detached because their profession is like that but for them to come it was that's quite remarkable to hear and then we also discussed uh, about devotees if they can contribute to writing in this area one is of course devotees going to hospice care the other is that uh, devotees learn that skills for themselves in case their family members are there so you mentioned about sangeeta mata ji providing online courses as well as personal tr- as well as training through courses and then if some devotees want to write writing is very individual so after we write we actually find out what we what we wanted to say but there is a lot which you said there's a welcome contribution in this area somebody wants to write and then toward the end we discussed about mishla prabhupad's uh, instruction to you about writing this book uh, writing the book on the on the juhu project so you shared some very uh 
very illuminating at once a challenging as well as illuminating past time from that book and also i think the 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 back matter of the book that you shared is very inspiring how different vaishnavas have appreciated up this was so among the few books that prabhu pad directly wanted us wanted to be written so thank you very much for sharing all this wisdom and nectar maharaj it is as i said sobering but still at the same time it's inspiring to see that as a movement we have we are providing more and more resources for our devotees as you said it has happened in vrindavan and devotees are becoming more and more aware elsewhere so you have been a pioneer for this and thank you for sparing your time today for sharing your experiences here thank you maharaj okay this is a beautiful summary you would like to add any concluding words maharaj i just had one thought while you were speaking that um uh, some years ago i went to visit the hospice in santa barbara and they had posted a list of lectures um you know uh death i don't know you know death and dying in the jewish tradition death and dying in the uh christian tradition death and dying in the buddhist tradition like they had a whole series but there was no death and dying in the hindu tradition and that highlighted to me the lack of of uh, information available on that topic which you know the book life's final exam uh remedies yes my right that's true so yeah so now if, if anyone wants to know our perspective they they can get it and um another little anecdote um i i would go to a chiropractor in santa barbara and his office was just like less than a block away from a a, a theater not a movie theater and um so one night a hospice nurse gave a well it was a short film i think maybe 45 minutes um about her work as a hospice nurse it's called the, the the nurse with the purple hair and uh it's funny how it came about uh well i don't want to digress too much but anyway the the film was made by a hollywood filmmaker who specialized in horror films but somehow he met her they were at some fair and somehow she was assigned to him and he asked her what she does and she said uh I'm a hospice nurse and she she said and he was like looking at her and she said do you have a problem with that he said no 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 i don't and then as he found out about what she did he got inspired to um to make that movie the nurse with the purple hair so it showed in that theater and she was present both of them she and the and the filmmaker were present and afterwards i met her in the lobby and i told her about the hospice in vrindavan and and life's final exam she took down the details she wanted to get life's final exam so it was it was nice it was nice and she was an another example of a spiritual person who was in hospice care like i said I, you you can't go into the that field without being spiritual otherwise it's too morbid Yes. so yeah she was a, a very nice lady yes so much and as you are saying i was thinking that now today is the age of social media and videos so probably something about the vaishnava contribution to hospice care 
if there were a, some kind of documentary or video that would reach a large number of people and maybe our discussion today can start off something in future who knows some some <laughs> we have a very talented devotee community and uh, that will come about thank you for sharing that anecdote maharaj and thank Pleasure. you very much for your time and your association yes thank you very uplifting and uh, edifying to hear all that you discussed thank you humble thank obeisances you for correcting it and inviting me thank you yeah shri prabhupad ki jai sunil giriraj swami maharaj ki jai thank you gopal tavrind ki jai so if we're going to end now i i suggest we conclude with vaishnav pranam yes is that please. all right yes please let us offer our respectful obeisances unto all the vaishnav devotees of the lord who are just like desire trees who can fulfill the desires of everyone and are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls panchakopatru vyascha kripa sindhu vyascha titanam kavane vyaishnavyo namaha anantakoti vaishnav rindiki jai prabhupad ki jai Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj.